Um, that is everything you need to know about Red Tennis, the career performance model. In one slide. Boom. Okay? So, I'll run you through it real fast. Over on this side, where you see the courts, that is how you need to be able, remember I'm going to send you all these slides anyway, that is how you need to be able to control the ball. So if you could only play in the shaded areas, what technically would you have to be able to do? You'd have to be able to do a short swing, you'd have to be able to do a long swing, you'd have to be able to change those two swings. Yeah, so the first two over there, yeah, you'd have to be able to play only cross court. And then you'd have to be able to play from this side to change the direction of the ball. So if you're on this one here, you would be changing the direction of the ball. Yeah, so these would be the core skills based on what the court's about. So if you can do those things, those are your core um, focuses in terms of directionals, if you want to call it that, or just ball controls within the court. You need to receive them in those spaces, send them in those spaces, yeah, and be able to control those spaces of the court. You can do that pretty well, right? You'll be good. These are the areas you need to be able to impact the ball based on the way the ball behaves in flight, based on the movement patterns that you've got approach. So pretty much most of the stuff you do in red, you're going to impact here and here. You don't hit many balls up here. And actually because the ball's kind of reasonably consistent and it flies a reasonably short distance and it bounces, you also don't have to open your attic base and slice or chip very much. You've got that good, nice, knee and waist impact point, and that's solid. You can do that really, really well. Yeah, those are the areas you have to be able to hit. These are the areas here you have to be able to cover on the court. Most red kids don't go to the net. You might get one or two that do, but most of the time they don't because A, their reaction speeds are slower. Yeah. And B, if you did want to go to the net, there's no approach. You can just make it in two or three steps. Most of the time, they move around the baseline. So this involves move, stop, balance. All right? Down here is then the way that kids think. All right? So this little symbol just means I need to be able to control spaces and the core. If I'm really good, I also start to be able to control time, which is why that's kind of a little bit shaded down. See that? So that's so. If you understand that, direct the ball there. Technically impact the ball there. Move like that and control the core. That's our big focus on red. That's the building blocks. All right, and that's where you should be focusing on. Now, if you're talking about performance, we are talking a little bit about performance this time, or at least player development. You're going to have um, musts, shoulds, and coulds. So your musts are those things on the screen. Every kid before they leave red should be able to do all those things. And if you don't, it's like you're going to build an upside down pyramid. If the base isn't big enough for the first bit, when you try and go further this way and then further this way, the whole thing's going to topple over and fall apart. Technically, tactically, yeah. You need to cement those things in. All right. This is also based on the cognitive development of the kid. That's red tennis. All right. So we're going to go on the court and we're going to take you through all the things how you bring that to life, how you, how you teach them to move, yeah, where those technical impact points would be, what drills you do there, and what this really means. All right? Okay, so then we've got that achieved. Um, if I've got a really good kid who's still small, I might start taking him to the next level. But if he's really small, he, still, he stays on this call. Um, when you think about learning, let's ask you a really interesting question. A lot of the messages that come out say, uh, learning happens because of opportunity. You hear a lot, uh, we're gonna make it easier for kids. Does making things easier make learning happen? No, okay. So are we all kind of agree this, there has to be an opportunity, in other words, I have to be ready, I have to be, I have to be um, physically ready Good example of that was years ago, Stanford did a study about tying shoelaces. Tried to get four year olds and six year olds to tie their shoelaces. The six year olds all learned within 30 minutes. The four year olds took three months. All right? So there's a good example of physical dexterity. When you're six, you learn real fast. Yeah? 
when you fall. It's not, it's impossible, because nothing's impossible for a human being. But it's really, really challenging. And if you wait till the six, you haven't wasted three months on it instead. <laughs> See that? So that's a little bit of a part of this. We're always in a hurry and in a rush. So that's basically a picture of red. So we've got must, should, and could. So on the must, <laughs> those are the musts. On the should, if we have a good kid who comes more often, three, four times a week, we might push them onto some of the next skills that are in orange. And then we have the coulds. Now the could is the kid who walks in on the first day and your only question is, shall I phone IMG or shall I phone Octagon? Yeah, they're just the phenomenon you've never seen before like that. But you can't fit them into the mainstream principles of what you're trying to teach. They're always going to be the outlier. They're always going to sit on the outside. So you can teach those kids anything. 